Good evening. If I could have your attention, please. I'd like to get going. I, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. This is a great turnout. Um, if you remember, if you have other children that went through this, we used to pack this into the uh, LGI, so this is a lot more comfortable than it used to be. Um, I do appreciate you coming out. I want to preface this. By the way, my name is Tom Lutzik. I'm the high school principal, and I'm going to introduce some other um, members of the administrative and counseling teams that are here also tonight. What we're going to do is we're going to go over a lot of information on a slideshow. Please remember, there's no quiz at the end. Um, it is a ton of information. It's going to be more than you're going to be able to digest, um, even taking notes and things like that. We are being recorded thanks to some of the student um, help desk students that we have and media students that we have. So we will send out a link and post it on the website also um, so that you can review the PowerPoint, the actual presentation, all of the information that is here. And of course you can um, you know, contact your counselor or administrator if you have any questions. So we'll go through that. That should take us a little less than an hour. I'm hoping 45 minutes or so. And then we will leave, break out and leave to the large cafeteria, which is out the back doors to your left, down the hallway, heading towards the new gym, through the quad area, and you'll see a large cafeteria. And we'll have some people directing you through. It's not really far at all. And then in the large cafeteria, there'll be some tables with the different departments, with the administrators and counselors there. And that is only if you have um, questions about some more detailed um, you know, requirements that you think you might have or questions about your students heading in a, your children heading in an individual or a particular uh, way that we don't cover uh, tonight in the presentation. But if, if you get everything that you think you need from the presentation, then great, wonderful, and have a good night. But if you do have some follow-ups, then you would, you know, want to come into the cafeteria with us, and we will do our best to answer your questions. The um, Dr. Hershenhart, uh, who does business and music, is unfortunately unable to be here tonight. Um, there is a table, though, with some brochures about the class offerings, and again, they are on the slideshow that we'll go through also. But unfortunately, she will not be here uh, to answer individual questions. So if you did have a follow-up or something for her, they'll have to be directed to her email or her phone extension, okay? Um, so I'd like to begin by um, introducing uh, the middle school counselors, Miss Anna Bartlett, if you can just, hello. Miss Maureen Pocal. Miss Danielle Heigel. And then um, the uh, high school counselors, uh, Ms. Knapp is unable to be here tonight, but we have Mr. Dvorak, <laughs> Ms. Murphy, <laughs> Ms. Galarno, <laughs> Ms. Sheehan, <laughs> Ms. Baumgartner. <laughs> then we're trying to fake you out, Ms. Kaplan over here. <clears throat> And we really have not set our counselor assignments um, yet. That's done alphabetically, and they generally stay pretty close. So if you've had some other children that have gone through, um, you kind of know the alphabetical breakdown. But we will be doing that. It'll be in school tool. We'll get information out about that as we get farther into the scheduling process. Um, we changed this year, we changed a little bit about how we do um, the principals and the assistant principals, they're now matched up to counselors. So there's no designated ninth grade counselor. And one of the advantage, or ninth grade administrator, one of the advantages we saw to that is when your child enters ninth grade now, he or she is going to have the same counselor and the same administrator for the entire four years that he or she is here. And we saw that as a big plus. So we break the, we'll break the administ, uh, assistant principals up uh, with the counselors. And so we have Mrs. Horalchuk. Ms. McManus, and Mr. Ward. Thank you. And we have um, some instructional administrators that are here, but they're going to come up and they'll do their presentations and they'll talk about their departments and the classes and the offerings that they have and they'll be introduced as they come up here. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Anna Bartlett and she'll kick off the program.
thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I, as uh, we said, there's a lot of information. Um, what we wanted to do is start off, though, by telling you about the process that's being used to help your children select their courses for next year. Um, so you see our timeline of events. Uh, things have kicked off already. In the beginning of January, uh, the three of us visited our eighth grade classes, and there we um, did a presentation for the students on planning the high school program. And that was a PowerPoint, which is also online. So if you'd like to see that, we'll be sending you the, um, the login address. And that included a lot of the information that you'll be hearing today. It was, um, it included the information about general graduation requirements and levels and the um, electives that they'll be able to choose from. So again, you'll hear some of that, but you also have the opportunity to look at the actual um, PowerPoint your children saw. And then um, we're about to start our small group meetings with students. We'll be meeting with the eighth graders in small groups of um, four to five students. And when they come in to see us, what they'll be doing is um, telling us a first and second choice of the electives that they would like to take. Unfortunately for ninth grade, it's a limited list. Um, we try to focus on getting their um, fine arts requirement done, and you'll be hearing more about that. Um, but we have them give us their first lit, first choice and then an alternate um, to make the scheduling process easier. And um, we're doing things paperless now, so no more forms for those of you who have older children, no more duplicate and triplicate forms floating around. Um, what we're going to be doing is um, we'll put in the electives that your child chose and also those students who are going through the honors selection process, which will be discussed a, a little more later. Um, the, the results of that will be entered. Um, the students who are currently in algebra and biology, recommendations for their next course will be entered. Um, our foreign language levels, recommendations will be in there. Um, so that when the portal opens on the 14th, you and your child can go in and pull up course selection and it will show you all those recommendations and selections. Um, if, uh, if everything looks fine, then you're done. You won't need to do anything. If, however, you look at that and you and your child discuss it and decide, well, I put down one course, but I think I want to try a different elective. Um, or, you know, I uh, recommended for an honors course, but I don't think I want to do that one. Um, any, any type of change like that that you'd like to make, you just need to let your counselor know. Um, you can email, uh, gives us a phone call. And in fact, if you want to come in and meet with your counselor, your child's counselor, before making these decisions, all you need to do is contact us and be happy to set up an appointment to sit down with you and your child and go through all the different decisions that need to be made. I know when uh, it's your oldest, it can be a little bit confusing and, and all sorting through all the information. So please don't hesitate to call your counselor if you'd like an appointment. So as I said, the portal will be opened. You'll be able to go in a school tool. And then by um, the 28th of February, we're gonna need to know any changes that you want made. That will be the deadline. And then um, we'll have all those selections in. And it won't be until uh, the end of August that your child will actually get to see their high school schedule. A lot of work goes into it between the end of February and the opening of school. Um, but they'll get to see that right before the opening of school. And who else to hit? Just hit the arrow. Okay, so some transitional activities that we have at the middle school in order to prepare for that move to the high school. Uh, look into the future is a classroom presentation and activity that the counselors did back in um, November. And it was geared at getting our students to start thinking about what their future might be like the fact that they're gonna have to make decisions and inform decisions and think about careers and college and salaries and all that great kind of stuff. And we um, also give them some resources as to where to go and look for that type of information. Uh, 
we um, also, there will be a high school visit coming up on May 16th, where students will come to the high school and they'll have um, tours of the building and also um, some different presentations will be done. Uh, another source of information, you'll see the address for the curriculum guide. Um, the students also saw that we, um, when we were in class, we showed them the link and how to get to the curriculum guide. Um, they received lists of the, the electives that are open to ninth graders, and then we told them that they needed to open the, the uh, curriculum guide and then look for descriptions of the classes, and we showed them how to do that. Oh, and also the parent handbook. Um, you should have received that, hopefully, by now electronically, right? We sent that out. So um, if you haven't, we will be sending it out shortly and just uh, email your counselor and we'll get you that electronically. And then, um, as we said earlier, the PowerPoint for tonight and the one from the classroom um, activities will be available to you. Uh, Mrs. Pokal has a Google Classroom and Mrs. Heigl and I have a website and we will be emailing you and sending you all kinds of information. So expect to have a lot of emails from us between now and the end of February. Okay, and now um, Ms. Kaplan will be talking to you about some of the high school information. Hello. So tonight I wanna talk to you about some ways that you can help us help your students as they transition from eighth to ninth grade. One of the big things that we want to stress is handing in work on time and then staying after school and having a regular routine where they meet with teachers. So in the beginning of the year, it is great to find out what days teachers are available after school, typically Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday until 310. Sometimes teachers have meetings, so it's good to have your student advocate for themselves and see what that schedule is ahead of time. Um, it's a student's responsibility at the high school to contact their teachers when they're absent. They can do that by email. A lot of teachers are on Google Classroom, so a lot of assignments, if you're absent, you can get from the classroom websites or from Google Classroom. Students should have some type of homework every night in the high school. If they tell you they don't, they're not telling you the truth. They should study uh, material that they talked about in class. Classes meet every other day at the high school. So it's good to get into the pattern of finding a routine where your homework, you do the homework the day the class meets so that if you have questions, you can see the teacher the next day and review material the following night for homework so they can be prepared. Um, manage the greater, the students are gonna have more independence at the high school. So encourage them to be careful what they post on social media. Um, we've been talking to a lot of colleges and colleges look at social media accounts. And sometimes that can be a deciding factor of whether or not a student is admitted if they have posted inappropriate things. Um, we are always here to help with conflict resolution and self-advocacy, but that's a really strong skill that we encourage students to have at the high school, is being able to talk to teachers and become more independent by asking questions and not being afraid of reaching out. It's okay to make mistakes. We all make them. We are all human. Um, we are here to help them learn and reflect, and so are you. We can all work together to help students. And then as parents, be ready for social emotional changes. Friend groups are going to change. It will be a transition and we're here to help with anything. Now I get to talk about the fun stuff. Um, to graduate from Gilderland High School, a student needs to earn 23 credits. Um, a full credit or a half credit is granted at the completion of a full year or half year course, as long as the student has earned a 65 or higher. Students also need to pass five regents exams with a score of 65 or higher. If a student fails a class, it will need to be taken in summer school or repeated the following year. So these, you don't have to memorize today. We meet with our families in ninth grade and 11th grade, um, and we meet with our students yearly. 
and they need to earn four credits of English, four credits of social studies, three credits in math, three credits in science, one credit in a foreign language, and one credit in fine art, half a credit in health, two credits in physical education, and then four and a half additional elective credits. The Regents exams that students need to pass with a 65 or higher are English, social studies, algebra one, science, and then one of the following pathways. And don't let the pathways scare you. Again, we meet with students and families so we can help you guide your student through which pathway is best for them. Typically, students will graduate with their five regents exams through the humanities pathway, and that's passing two social studies regents exams, global and US history with a 65 or better. Another option is the STEM pathway, and students score a 65 or higher on a second science or a second math exam. There's also a biliteracy pathway, so that's the completion of a foreign language requirement um, and state approved foreign language assessment. There's a CTE pathway, so the completion of a state approved CTE program or a state approved assessment. And then an arts pathway, which is the completion of an arts sequence and then a state approved arts assessment. For an advanced regents diploma, students will have to complete the requirements for a regents diploma and then an additional three or four units of a world language and culture and pass the geometry, algebra two, a second science and the world language and culture equivalency exam, which we call the checkpoint B. And now I'm going to introduce Allison Relier. She is a PE teacher who teaches dance here at the high school. Hi everyone, um, I'm here to talk about the dance curriculum and to introduce the um, fine arts requirements. There are two classes offered at the high school that students can take to earn their art elective credit in dance. One is choreography of dance and the second is dance styles. Students do not need to have a dance background in order to take these classes and they're designed for all experience levels. The choreography of dance class is designed to tap into creative dance movements performing choreography through a series of five different themed projects. The dance styles course is for students who want to learn more about dance genres. They will learn about tribal, court, ballroom, jazz, square dancing, musical theater, and over 35 folk dances from all around the world. The classes are offered for grades nine through 12th grade, and they meet every other day in the block schedule. If you have any questions about either course, please feel free to email me. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Shannon Elliott, the Fine Arts Supervisor. Thank you. Hello, I'm glad to be here. Uh, students need to take one fine arts course to meet that requirement. In visual art, we now have two ways to do it. They can take studio in art or studio in media arts which is a more obviously digital-based way to go. In music, we have the music in our lives, um, mixed choir, orchestra, band, and music technology. So there are a lot of options. Um, and we also have in technology, we have DDP or drawing and uh, design and drawing for uh, production. So um, it is possible for students to take more than one of these at a time, and we can tell you more about that, how to do it, uh, if you have those questions. All right, thank you. Oh, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> this is our um, uh, chart. It's a flow chart to show you um, two possible art sequence pathways. Um, the one on you can see that it's hard to read, it's very small, but I can, we can make sure to share this with you. Students can uh, come into the art program three different ways. If a student is taking accelerated art in eighth grade, they can then move to uh, drawing and painting or another course as soon as they get to the high school. Or they would take studio in art or studio in media art. 
One pathway would be a more traditional art making pathway, drawing and painting, ceramics, sculpture, that kind of thing. Another, and, and these pathways are meant so that students can build portfolios and go into that field. The other pathway is the um, technology, the digital uh, ways of making art. So that would be photography, media arts, graphic design, um, art in game design, other things like that. And so they would build that type of portfolio. Um, they can also not take a pathway. They can take a foundation course, studio and art or studio and media art, and then take whatever they would like as an elective. Okay, now I'm really going. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Piscatelli. I'm the instructional administrator for math, science, and technology at the high school. Um, I wanted to start off by talking about STEAM. And you're probably used to hearing the expression rather referred to as STEM, science, te technology, engineering, and math. But at the high school, we really, we really believe in STEAM, which we add in the arts component. One thing, and I listed up here, and I'm sure this is not an exhaustive list of the area. These are all companies that, have, that are based in a STEM career area. So there is plenty of opportunities for our students right in the capital region area to find a career in STEM. But to, to give you an example, a couple years ago I was at the first playable uh, company in Troy, which is a game design company. And again, they have, they have computer programmers and they have software engineers there, but they also, almost half of their staff were artists that contribute to the designs that are then turned into computer programs. So it's very important to realize, as Ms. Elliott was just saying when she was talking about the media arts, those areas are very much linked together. A couple of years ago, we decided we were going to try to create a concept called the STEAM Academy. And really what the idea was, was to give students a sequence of courses in areas where they might find interest for a potential career or college major down the road. The areas that we're, we're really trying to focus on are pre-engineering, uh, computer science, uh, medical and biological sciences, clean energy, earth and space. So in those areas, I'll talk about the Project Lead the Way program, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But computer science, we're talking about computer programming, AP computer science, game design, um, and mobile app design. When we're talking about the medical and biological sciences, we're talking about giving students experiences in nursing, physical therapy, biotechnology, um, pharmaceutical science, clean energy, clean energy, that's what we're talking about in that. And Earth and Space, we're trying to add in next year courses in meteorology and natural disasters so that students can start exploring those areas. Project Lead the Way. Project Lead the Way is a pre-engineering program. It's a full, we have four courses at Gilliland High School. Design and Drawing for Production, which meets the fine arts requirement, is really it's the DDP name is kind of a throwback to a traditional New York State course. Design and drawing for production really should be called introduction to engineering design because that is the focus of the course. Um, I know in the the eighth grade technology program all of your students now are getting exposed to a software program called Inventor. That is like one of the main components of design and drawing for production is to teach students how to use that software in depth. They will practice doing paper and three-dimensional designs, but it, in the second half of the year, most of the year is focused on doing the designs using the Inventor program. And that is really critical, because the other three courses, Civil Engineering and Architecture, Principles of Engineering, and Digital Electronics, you can take any of those courses in any sequence you want but you have to have the design and drawing for, for production class first. So even though we show them in the typical sequence that students take, 
they are all available to take. And if you don't have an interest in one area versus another, you don't have to feel like you have to take all four. Um, again, in project lead the way, the main thing we're focused on throughout all four, four courses is the engineering design process. But students will get exposed to what is computer-aided design. Civil engineering and architecture spends a lot of time talking about the architecture of a residential and a commercial type of building. Digital electronics is all about circuit boards and how electricity is used in those. Robotics. And then the last thing, and it kind of deals with the robotics, I just want to call your attention to, because we have a lot of freshmen that participate in this. We, we're going on our third year of having the VEX Robotics Club, which the VEX program is we get a team of students together. We actually have two robots now for the first time. We've only had one the two previous years. The students design the robot to meet certain competition attributes. So they, they has to do something like pick up a cone, place it on another one, or shove balls under a, a bar. But the students go to competitions. It's truly a team event. They go to competitions and they compete with area schools. And our team historically has done extremely well in these competitions. We got to states last year and we're hoping we get to states again this year. But it's a great opportunity. If you're looking for an opportunity to apply science, engineering, math, art, you've got the perfect opportunity with the VEX Robotics Club. And anyone can join. They will find a role for you on that club. OK, shifting gears to math and science. Um, I used to separate this out, but I decided this year I'm just going to kind of talk about this in, in one slide. Um, first of all, I got to clarify something that I think sometimes gets misunderstood. In eighth grade, if you are in Algebra 1, in Regents Geometry, you are in an accelerated course right now. It is not an honors course. It's an accelerated course. So when you come next year, and if you're transitioning to honors geometry or honors earth science, that will be your first experience in an honors level course at the high school. Now, what is the differences between the honors geometry and Regents Geometry and honors earth science and Regents earth science? The two biggest things I'll, st I'll say, and it's true in both courses, is they both cover the same curriculum. They will cover everything you need to know for the Regents exam that you're going to take in June. The difference is, is both courses the, at the honors level, they will go into much more depth in those courses, and they will add additional topics. The expectations for the students are, are higher in those honors classes because they're an honors level class. Students will be expected to be more independent. They will be expected to complete all the work on time. They will be expected to be uh, advocates of themselves when they do not understand something. Kind of a good example um, in honors geometry, instead of giving the students the proofs, the theorems that they're going to use in proofs, those students might have to derive those proofs before they can use them in a proof. So that's just an example of the, the level of expectations that changes from the honors versus the regents. I know that's going to be a big question at the table. So if you have more questions about that, don't be afraid to ask me at the table. OK, I am going to turn things over to our instructional administrator for social studies and English, Mr. Alex Pincel. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to quickly review our English and Social Studies program and our literacy tutorial uh, offering. So English, we have uh, four years that are required. Three of the four years, 9, 10, and 11, culminate with the Common Core English Regents exam in 11th grade. And beyond that, students need to take one full year in their 12th grade year or sometimes in their junior year of elective English credits. Uh, English is pretty much divided into four areas, speaking and listening, writing, reading, and uh, language. It is very important that um, if you have questions about the honors procedures, this is kind of the one area that seems to be a buzz with people, or be available at the table uh, afterwards to answer any questions. You know, as uh, Mr. Piscatelli said, you know, there is acceleration and that somewhat precedes honors here at the high school. So we want to make sure that students are placed where they can be challenged 
and that they can grow where they're at. We have a multi-measures uh, assessment that we use, a performance test, which is going to be starting in the next two weeks, teacher skill-based recommendations, and uh, we look at some grades as well. Okay, moving into social studies, or excuse me, literacy tutorial. We offer this to students who need help in the areas of decoding, fluency, uh, some writing skills. It's available to all kids. It's credit bearing. Students can take it for one semester, two semesters. Uh, if your reading teachers or English language arts teachers recommend this for you, I strongly encourage your students to participate in this. Our social studies program. Like English, students are required to take four years of social studies. The first two years are Global 9, Global 10, or Global Part 1, Global Part 2. In our junior year is the U.S. History curriculum. And then finally, in the senior year, we are required to take economics and public policy. A couple things just to be aware of, because there are some changes right now to the Global Studies Regents exam. Your children are going to be the first ones who are going to be exposed to this new ramped up version of the Global Regents exam, which focuses on having students apply greater level of thought and analysis. Uh, we have been doing a really great job right now in our department for the past two years to make instructional changes to help kids be prepared. And that's part of the reason why when we have these honors assessments that we want to make sure that the students are ready, prepared, and able to succeed in their career here. Um, we have the Global History Regents exam in 10th grade, and we have the U.S. History Regents exam in 11th grade. If you're going to take the Humanities Graduation Pathway, both of those are required. If not, just one of those two uh, is necessary. Just a little FYI, we have a lot of uh, wonderful electives in both English and Social Studies that we have been able to provide where students can get college credit now through either Hudson Valley, Schenectady County Community College, Syracuse University, and of course we also have some traditional AP courses as well. These include criminal justice, college writing, social problems, and hopefully more as uh, you know we try to provide more opportunities. Lastly, you might hear that we have a, an aligned program, so very briefly on what that is, we have two teachers at grade level in ninth, 10th, and 11th grade who work closely together to have aligned curriculum. What does that mean? Well, if you're gonna learn about US history, it might be helpful to also read about, say, you know, The Great Gatsby while you're reading about the 1920s. So that is a very complementary uh, instructional practice. So when you're in English class, you have the content to inform what you're reading. And at the same time, while you're in the social studies class, the social studies teacher can help leverage writing practices, reading practices that they're learning in the English class. I can provide you with more information about Align afterwards at the tables. Uh, and right now I will introduce Ms. Marsha Ranieri, who is our Instructional Administrator for World Languages. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk to you about our world language and a little bit about our ENL program tonight. Um, world languages are recommended by most four-year colleges. So if your child is in a world language at the middle school, Spanish, French, German, or Italian, they're likely going to continue that language when they come here to the high school. They do have the opportunity to switch. We offer the same offerings at the middle school as we do at the high school. And for the first time next year, we're going to offer a new course, and I'll get to that in just a second. That course next year is American Sign Language. So your students for the first time will have the opportunity of enrolling in American Sign Language. There's only going to be one section for students in grades 9 through 12. So it's really a first come, first serve basis. If we have a whopping number of people that want to sign up, We'll do our best uh, when it comes to budgetary times to make sure that students can get into that course, if not perhaps in their 10th or 11th grade year. This is our course flow chart. So as you can see at the top, American Sign Language is really in its own island at the moment. We're going to start with Sign Language 1 and then go on to Sign Language 2, 3, and 4 as the years progress. Most students enroll in a Spanish 2, French 2, German 2, Italian 2 class. Some students enroll in 2A. 
hopefully your child has come home and said to you, my teacher really wants me to enroll in Spanish 2A, or my teacher really thinks I should just take Spanish 2. That's up to your child, that's up to your family, that's up to the decision that the teacher talks about with you. So if you have questions about 2 or 2A, I can answer those questions for you tonight at the table. But really you want to go back to your classroom teacher, to the French, Spanish, German, or Italian teacher and talk to them. We only offer 2A as you can see in French and Spanish. So if your child takes German or Italian, they will all go into German 2 or Italian 2. So how do I decide between 2 or 2A? 2 is the typical track for all of our ninth graders who take language. That's the class that you enroll in after taking language at the middle school. If your child is not taking a language at the middle school, they can go into, as you see on the chart, we have here Spanish 1. They can enroll in Spanish 1 and then get their sequence that way. Or if they've taken a language at the middle school, they're going to enroll in either 2 or 2A. Two 2A two is for that student who's very advanced, really enjoys language, is accepting of the fact that language will be spoken in the target language of French or Spanish the entire time. Um, and they have to know that there's going to be a lot of homework at night. The 2A classes are going at pr approximately a six times faster pace because if you think about the class that they took in the middle school, I saw your faces just drop. <laughs> <laughs> the class that they took in the middle school is one credit over three years. The class they'll be taking at the high school is two credits over one year. So it's a lot faster than what they're used to. It's in the target language. I observed a 2A class today, it was wonderful. The students are doing amazing. The teacher spoke in French the entire time. They did a lot with culture, they did a lot with language. It's a very captivating experience if they're interested in that. Here's some quick benefits of speaking another language. I'm not sure I necessarily need to go through all of these. Our population at Gilderland High School is changing every single day, so the benefit of learning a language is really right in front of us. This gives you a graph of an explanation of students that are here in our high school that speak other languages. You may not know that Gilderland High School has a large percentage of English language learners. This year here at the high school, there's 30 English language learners. In our district overall, there's 250. In years past, this has never been a part of our presentation, but as our numbers grow and increase, I felt it was really important for all of you parents to know all of the different languages that are spoken here. Next up, Mr. Regan Johnson. You're doing great. Almost done here. My, I'm Regan Johnson. I'm the director of athletics for the school district. I also supervise physical education and health. Um, wanted to talk real quick about playing college athletics. Um, last year, 50% of our students in the high school played a sport. And many of those student athletes go on and play at the NCAA level. Um, and so one of the things I want to make sure you leave here tonight is if your son or daughter is interested in doing that someday, um, because these four years will go very fast. Um, we want to make sure that you communicate that with your guidance counselor. When you have your ninth grade meeting next year, um, please make sure that you let your guidance counselor know because the NCAA has strict rules on uh, courses that they are accept to get into the clearinghouse, which is what allows them to play Division One or Division Two sports. Um, if you want to watch a guidance counselor squirm, um, you can tell them in their junior year that, hey, I think I'm going to play Division One sports. And meanwhile, you took one class or maybe two in the ninth or tenth grade year that were not approved by the NCAA, and then trying to get them in and eligible their first semester is going to be almost impossible. So we want to make sure that you do that. You know, we're not here to squash dreams, but the reality is that there's about 7.8 million student athletes across the country that play high school sports. A little over 5% go on and play NCAA anything, okay? That's one, two, or three. So about 2% of the population go on and play Division One or Division Two and get a scholarship. And the average scholarship is $11,000. So. If you, if you know what the average scholarship for like going to academics, that, that route, it's about 17,000. So your student has a better opportunity to get that than necessarily a college athletic scholarship. So 
But there's a plenty of stats that I can share. If you have questions, um, I'll be in the cafeteria. Thank you very much for your time. To close it out, Mr. Lutzik is going to go over the last slide. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, show you an example of what the schedule looks like. And again, no quizzes here. It, it really looks a lot more complicated than it is. The kids figure it out pretty much in no time at all. Um, but one of the things that you'll notice is that um, science meets three times. We go every other day. Most classes will meet on an A and C day or a B and B day. Science at in ninth grade is going to meet three days and then PE is matched up with that. As they move through the progression and they move to be upperclassmen, there are more science classes that will meet two days out of the cycle, more like a traditional class. I guess the one thing, and other people have mentioned this, um, is it is every other day. It's 84 minutes for each class that students are in. They really have to be able to manage their time, stay organized, and stay on top of things. And it's not just homework that they would receive, but a lot of times we don't think about studying as homework, and it is. So they may, have, they may have completed a worksheet or a study packet or something along those lines, but they haven't studied it. So it is really important for them, for the best performance, is to study that and develop those skills as they get older, those study skills. It's a term we throw around a lot, but not a lot of us are really adept at doing that, particularly just when we're starting high school. So that's really important. The time management aspect of every other day classes, um, I don't know if any of you procrastinate. It's really, easy, it's really easy to say, you know what, I just had math. I had math first block on Monday, and I'm not going to have it again until first block on Wednesday. Yeah, I've got 15 problems to do. I'm just going to put that off. But then the other classes happen, the next day happens with those other classes, and all of a sudden you've got the homework from them, and now, oh, whatever happened to that math? And really one of the toughest things that I see students struggle with is, and, and I hate to use cliches, but they're cliches for a reason, they dig that hole. And once you dig a little bit of a hole where I didn't get that assignment in, didn't get that assignment in, now all of a sudden, it, you know, it's not uncommon to say, oh, what's the use, you know? And that's the cycle that we don't want to start. We want to avoid doing that. And I always used to tell my students when I taught, there is nothing worse grade-wise than a zero. Nothing. It, math, and I'm not a math teacher, but that kills you. You know, a zero in that average thing is, is not good. So yeah, just, you know, try, try and get your work done in the word self, the word self advocacy had, or phrase has been thrown around. And that is really important. If you do fall behind for some reason, or there's some issue that comes up, I don't know a teacher in this building, an administrator, a counselor, anybody in this building that isn't willing to work and help a child through that. But they have to let us know what's going on. You know, go to your teacher, say, such and such happened. Can I have an extra day? Can I, you know, whatever the case may be that you need, the teacher, the teacher will work with you. And we want you to succeed so that you don't start that cycle over so that you're able to get caught up. Also, the activity period, I would point out, is, uh, again, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday primarily where there are late buses. And, you know, it provides a, a good 47-minute period. And even, a, you know, a chance to maybe see a couple teachers to do that. Or even if you had to go to the library, and most days the library is open a little bit after school, and study, you know, in a quiet place, do something like that. So there's a gap, too, between that activity period and when sports start. So if you are in a sport, we actually have a study hall in the cafeteria where the kids can go. Um, but use that time wisely. If you're here for practice that starts at 310 or 330, whatever it may be, have your children, you know, use that time. I know it's really easy to hang out with friends and, and goof around. I, I love doing that too, but it is really important. You have that time, use it. 
um, and, and you, it'll pay off in the end. So when I'm talking about sports, and you'll hear this as we go along, there are also a lot of co-curriculars, clubs. It is really important. I don't encourage students to stretch themselves so much that they end up suffering academically. So you have to, again, prioritize and be wise about what you're doing. But to form some kind of other connection other than just going to your classes is so important. And we have, I think, 53. What are we up to, Ms. Ms. McManus? 53 club? Ah, 61. All right, clubs <laughs> and different activities that they can do. So, uh, and some apparently I don't even know about. So find out about them. Uh, but that is really essential that they start forming those connections to school. Meeting new students, is, as the counselors have, have mentioned, um, dyna dynamics change, friendships change. Girls meet boys, boys meet girls. All of a sudden, they're not buddy buddy with the, you know, people that they used to be. It, it happens. It's part of growing up, and we can all remember that. It, the important thing is to remember that that happens. Be supportive and help them navigate through those decisions and and those social emotional issues that pop up as they mature. So again, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. If you have additional questions, we're in the large cafeteria, out the doorway to the left, through the quad, and straight ahead. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>